so what I want to speak about are basically two things. Uh, one thing, the second part is highly speculative, uh, and that's what we are working on right now. And before to give the impression that we are also doing decent stuff, yeah, I will uh, just give you a few of the results we have obtained earlier. And the main idea is that uh, we try really to apply uh, ADS to QCD in heavy ion physics. And okay, I will tell you how far we got along that. Okay, no, oops, right, yeah, okay. Uh, so the key question in heavy ion physics is basically you shoot these heavy ions on top of one another. You want to know whether you really uh, produce a thermalized uh, system such that you can analyze, for example, the situation which you had in the early universe. And you can look at that, for example, by looking at the hydrodynamic expansion of this matter. And then what you see here is if you have an energy density in the middle, then in the to the top, yeah, it decays to the vacuum slower than uh, in the horizontal direction, and that turns out you know, is parameterized by what is called elliptic flow. And you see this perfectly consistently because all experiments. It's called V two, and these are these data points. Uh, and you can uh, look also at uh, all kinds of details. You will always find that hydrodynamics gives a very good description of heavy ion physics, which is kind of surprising. For example, uh, you have only very, very little time. Yeah, I mean, you have like at LHC a huge gamma factor such that uh, these things are very strongly Lorentz contracted. So the, the width is only a small fraction of a Fermi while the transfer size uh, over which you have to thermalize is something like 10 Fermi's, uh, which um, you have problems to see how all of that can become really thermalized in view of causality. And in addition, the energy density of uh, a heavy ion realistically is not at all smooth, but you have large fluctuations like this. Now that is supposed to be a more realistic view. And this is then for more peripheral collisions where this overlap pitch becomes smaller. So it's kind of surprising that in such a short time which you have uh, such an inhomogeneous system should at all uh, become homogeneous and thermalized. Uh, uh, okay, and then there's another principal problem, namely that to have a thermalized system like this famous fireball, you also have to produce entropy, but QCD is time reversal invariant. So you cannot really uh, put, I mean, it's a unitary time evolution, so you cannot really produce entropy. So there is obviously a mismatch. Uh, and there are many more details which I don't have uh, time to go into. We'll just, uh, well, perhaps show you first that there are real experiments taking tons and tons of data, there are petabytes of data. So the experimental situation is great, it's just the theoretical understanding which is insufficient. And there are things like, uh, I mean, just one plot to demonstrate that, that is the yield you get for different hadron species, yeah, like pions, kaons, protons, lambdas, and so on. And then you simply fit that by a thermal distribution with basically a single parameter, which is a temperature. And well, this iron chemical potential is basically zero. And that fits everything, this one parameter fit in, down to even very exotic states like hypertriton, yeah, which is a bound state of a proton, a neutron, and a lambda, baryon, all the antiparticles, all that. And it fits perfectly. The, this one parameter fit are these black lines, and the red points are the experimental data from Alice. And that is really surprising because these states here are bound by only a fraction of an MeV, and they are supposed to be in a hadron gas of basically 150 MeV. Uh, the time scale you have is really short. That was said before. It's only like 10 to 15 Fermi's uh, hadronization. So in addition, you have substantial 
GUI components in there, but still everything, I mean, these dates a couple of different times, but still everything looks thermal. There's another point like this bound state because it's so weakly bound, it's actually larger than the system of these two colliding uh, nuclei. So again, you are left with a problem of causality. Normally you would expect that you have some form factor effect which suppresses the yield, which however does not happen. And you can go on and on like that, which I don't have time to do. So on the one hand side, you have perfect description of nearly all properties of the system in terms of biodynamics, which includes entropy production. And on the other hand, you have this general uh, problem that you have to understand why the, you do not have simply unitary time evolution. Uh, and this re should remind you a lot of the information problem of black holes where you have the same thing. On the one hand side, you expect that formation of a black hole and decay is a unitary process, yeah, which would be the lower picture. On the other hand, uh, Hawking radiation looks down. Okay, and uh, the question is which of these is correct? Yeah? And then uh, there is one important other piece of information which comes from quantum information. And that is that uh, when you have a more or less pure state in the initial case, you do not produce entropy, which means you do not lose information. Then, um, uh, oh, actually, that was too fast. Then uh, you will have a typical page curve, which means that, like in the decay of a black hole, like entropy increases a certain while and then it turns actually back and goes down to the initial value. Uh, and the question is, how could you possibly have a page curve for a heavy ion collision? That's what explains the title. Now, here I wanted to explain a bit this ETH, which I don't have time to do. Uh, now, our approach, and I'm now in the studio section of the things we have done previously. Uh, our approach is that uh, we really want to uh, describe the differences between uh, a holographic description and uh, QCD in one way or another. And the underlying idea is visible in this plot. Namely, one has different descriptions. Here is QCD, here is ADS, CFD. Uh, this is random matrix theory, this uh, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is a generalization of random matrix here, and you know that, for example, SYK uh, fulfills ETH properties. Uh, you know, and as I will show, that QCD fulfills in the matrix theory, and we work on this link trying to make this very complicated. Okay, now I said that uh, in the matrix theory, uh, or QCD fulfills in the matrix theory. Now that we showed already many years ago, actually more than 20 years by now, uh, by looking at predictions of random matrix series, which are here the next neighbor spacings between eigenvalues of the Dirac operator on the lattice. And the blue curves are the prediction. This is just the next one, and these are all the following ones. So you get always predictions from random matrix series, which are the blue curves, and the red curves are what we found on the lattice. So that agrees that we uh, perfectly well. And the general uh, picture is that you have random matrix theory, which is valid up to a certain limit in uh, energy differences, which is called the Saulus energy. And then you can describe also QCD with some effective atomic description like spiral perturbation theory. And then you have full fledged QCD. And you can make this quantitative by looking at certain quantities like this is a disconnected tile susceptibility of these eigenvalues of the Dirac operator. The only thing, reason why we choose that is that these are very smooth curves. Yeah? So random matrix theory is just a straight line. If you put it here, if you plot it in a double logarithmic plot, the lattice data are these extremely precise points and chiral perturbation theory gives you this description you see that lattice points 
fit nicely to animate theory. These are the discretization effects which we should disregard. Um, and uh, then there's a region where these effective models is tighter. Okay, so that's fine. So that was the one link, and that we established uh, 20 years ago. And since then, we tried to establish this link to ads -CFT. So as I said, uh, this heavy ion collision from the initial state to a fireball to the final hydronic state that we try to uh, describe just uh, holographically uh, with the formation of a big black hole um, and so on. Uh, I will come to that in a moment. Originally, the first thing we did is we used uh, a wider metric to calculate uh, the time it takes really to reach uh, equilibration, and that really turned out to be extremely fast, much faster than you would have imagined. But that was for homogeneous energy distribution here on the boundary. And as I showed you before, for real heavy ion physics, energy density is not uniform. Uh, so what we showed there is that this equilibration goes fast and that it's really top down, meaning that small distances uh, thermalize first. But still, as we were told in the last talk, uh, QCD is not really a conformal field theory and there are many uh, differences. For example, N is not very large, it's just C. It's not really a conformal theory. You can calculate it. Uh, by, uh, I mean, the effects of non conformality either by what is called conformal perturbation theory, and we did that, or for example, in dimensional regularization, you can tune uh, the dimension, this epsilon parameter, such that it becomes completely conformal, and then you can calculate uh, the correction of this epsilon. Uh, what you can also do. Uh, is, uh, I mean, that was, you, you can also look at the effect of N not being very large, and that you can only do on the lattice because it's all completely non perturbative. So that was first done by Panero, who looked at, uh, for example, the ratio here of pressure over uh, T to the 4. And that was for SU3, SU4, SU5, SU6, SU8, and it scaled by the number of uh, gauge fields in each case. That's why then all these uh, cases fall on top of one another. And actually, uh, the properties seem not to change uh, qualitatively when they are scaled with this uh, number of gluon fields or gauge fields between C and A. Uh, so it seems that N equals C is not such a big problem. Uh, actually, that was for uh, for the high temperature phase. This was even done for the low temperature phase, where you looked at uh, like meson masses or decay constants, and again you looked at many different events which you can do in a quench lattice calculation. And that was by Gunavali et al. And what you see here is that. Uh, Again, if you scale with a number of gauge fields, which is done by the string tension, that you get for many quantities things which behave completely perfectly uh, scaling, which means that SU3 is really not so far from SU infinity. Uh, and then coming back uh, to this uh, conformal symmetry, one element of conformal symmetry is scale invariance. So we looked at that is calculations where we broke the scale invariance by hand by introducing a background magnetic field, which are here different values. And then again, if you plot, for example, the ratio of transverse over longitudinal pressure, which is a thermodynamic property, and you plot it not with respect to T and B, but with respect to this dimensionless quantity, you will find perfect scale. So it seems that although here in this case, conformal symmetry is explicitly broken by the background field, oops, not here, by the background field, um, still you have a very nice uh, scaling properties. And then we also, because as I said also in the last talk, QCD is not, um, uh, 
ADS uh, conformal SUN and so on theory. So for example, one thing is we do we did, we calculated in string theory, the corrections due to the fact that the lambda parameter is not infinite, but something like 11 in QCD. And then you find that, I mean, you analyze the quasi-normal modes and you find that the imaginary part changes by a factor of two, which means that the thermalization time doubles, like from 0.1 Fermi over C to 0.2 Fermi over C, which is still very, very fast. Now, that was the first order of these corrections which we could calculate, and you got a factor two correction, which really tells you that QCD is not this uh, ideal conformal theory, but you, at least there is hope that uh, if you could calculate higher orders in string perturbation theory, you would get convergence to a phenomenologically acceptable result. Okay, then. Uh, Perhaps one last example. Uh, as I said, in reality, the energy densities are very different. So a heavy ion collision, even like a symmetric dead lead collision, you can think of as having many pixels which collide, which could be very asymmetric. On one side, you could have a much larger energy density than on the other side, such as the thing moves with this in the CM system with a substantial momentum and you could wonder whether that doesn't hinder thermalization to occur just because you have, for example, di different time delay, uh, uh, time dilatation effects. Uh, therefore, we calculated that in ADS-CFD quite carefully and uh, I really cannot go into the details. You find it here and on the slides, uh, you actually find all uh, the citations relevant. And what you find is, uh, what is plotted here is um, the difference between the energy density in ADS and the energy density in a hydrodynamic description. And at some point when the thing hydrodynamic, no, behaves hydrodynamically, this difference becomes smaller than the certain threshold which defines this line. Yeah? And what you see is that this is not a constant time, but this is rather an eigen time. Uh, which is Lorentz invariant, and therefore you will have uh, thermalization of the full system at a constant eigentime. And that explains why this uh, inhomogeneous structure doesn't uh, invalidate this rapid uh, thermalization. There was another nice result from this calculation, namely we could uh, deduce how these two energy densities have to be averaged get the correct average density uh, in the CM system. And it turns out that uh, it uh, has to be the geometric mean. And there is a purely phenomenology, phenomenological uh, deduction of what you need really to describe heavy ion physics correctly that is found in this paper. And they use a parametrization like that, which means that the energy densities of two colliding nuclei can be averaged in any way. Yeah? If the p-parameter has uh, changes uh, in, in value between minus infinity and plus infinity, you move from the taking the minimal of the two densities to the maximum, uh, passing by the arithmetic average as well as the geometric average. And uh, actually what you find is that um, you get only a good description of the experimental data, and that is here you know, the best fit these people have reached if you assume this to be a geometrical uh, average, which is also done in at least one of these standard codes. So that is also a prediction we get from this uh, ADS description of the ion code. Okay, and then perhaps the very last thing, uh, what we did recently in ADS, you calculate the size of the uh, apparent horizon, which has to do with the size uh, with the Kolmogorov-Sinei entropy in classical uh, nonlinear systems. So you have to average over very many initial starting values to get many trajectories how this apparent horizon behaves. But if you average over very many of them, you get pretty much a straight line. And that is what already Jeffy found in their very first 
war noch so sehr gefasst. Äh, Papers, hier Laternen verweisen, which ties us linearly. And actually, we repeated that, uh, and we also find uh, uh, this linear rise of this uh, um, apparent horizon. Actually, we have slight uh, oscillations on that. Now, there was a prediction how the, uh, this should happen uh, if you go to very large n SPN theory. The reason is that this slope classically is given by the sum of all positive Yapunov exponents. And there is a suggestion in the literature actually by Mother Nori and collaborators uh, that um, uh, every single Yapunov exponent becomes a maximum allowed by this Maldasena Stanford uh, Schenker bound such that uh, because this is the sum of all positive, it's directly, the slope is directly proportional to how many of these positive Japanov exponents you have. So if you have a picture like that in a gauge theory, because of the gauge species of freedom, you always have a certain fraction which is zero, but then you have um, this maximum value, which is 2 pi p, and either you assume that all the others have the same, value, then this would be both a plus one, or you would assume that you have the same number of expanding and contracting directions. Uh, in that case, the Liouville theorem is, um, is uh, preserved, and you do not um, generate any entropy. So that we could test, actually, by taking the average over millions of starting uh, uh, configurations and doing calculating these trajectories of the parent horizon in each case. And what we found is really this behavior, uh, more precisely, this is normalized such that this behavior corresponds to one. And then depending on how we actually take this ensemble average, uh, you get a slight uh, scatter around that, but in principle, it's a very clear indication that in the large n limit in an SPN gauge theory, you get really maximum Yapunov exponents and Liouville's theorem is fulfilled. Okay, that is what we did in the past. And just <laughs> to show that we try also to do uh, non-speculative stuff. However, we are kind of running out of things we can still calculate. So uh, we were looking for new topics to uh, address. And one possibility is to try really to push these ADS techniques beyond uh, the page time. Yeah, I mean, when then at some point the entropy has to go down again. And um, basically, the idea is to use all this recent progress one has made in understanding the black hole information problem uh, from string theory, from holography, uh, and just try to translate that into heavy ion physics. Now, uh, and the general idea is that in a heavy ion collision, you're not really producing a thermalized ensemble, but you produce a highly entangled quantum state. Uh, yeah, such that you do not lose any information. You can run the film backwards. However, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to see differences experimentally between these two cases. Now, uh, let me therefore describe a little bit uh, how really a heavy ion physics, uh, heavy ion collision looks like. And then uh, I will say a few remarks on how we hope that we can describe that. Now that here is a typical heavy ion uh, uh, collision in the hydrodynamic description. Uh, what you have here is the time, what you have here is the transverse direction, and what you see is you form a fireball, which is hot, yeah? and then it starts from the very beginning to emit uh, hydrons from the surface. However, this hydrodynamics becomes unstable at some point, and then the rest of the fireball hydronizes at, at once. And the other point you see here is that QCD is not really a 
uh, phase transition, it's really more a crossover. So you have two production mechanisms for hadrons. One is this final hadronization. The other thing is just emission from the space. Now, if you look at numbers, you find that this first thing is typically between 10 and 20 percent, and the rest is like 70 or 80 percent, something like that. So both are relevant. OK. Uh, and now, how can you describe that uh, in uh, string theory? Now, the first part, namely you have a fireball, you emit uh, hadrons from the surface, you can think of as uh, being analogous to Hawking radiation. Yeah, because a hadron, like a proton, cannot exist within the fireball. So this is really kind of a horizon. Um, and it gets emitted. Uh, if you look at single contributions, they look uh, thermal, but you know that uh, in reality, you do not lose information in normal black hole evaporation. This is done by island formation. Uh, and uh, well, I mean, here you have to have some speed. And yes, then the idea, you have five minutes. Thanks. Yeah. And then you see that as this progresses, yeah, you need more and more of these. And um, just copying an idea actually from uh, Maldasena and Saskin, uh, you can think of these, uh, this kind of Hawking radiation to be related to the, here it's a remnant of the black hole, in our case, it's a remnant of the fireball. By Einstein Rosen prejudice in the situation of dimension. Yeah, so the idea is uh, in just boundary theory, yeah, you form a fireball, you emit hadrons, however, everything is quantum entangled, the hadrons are entangled with one another. Uh, you emit like a hadron to the outside, the whole is like a decoherence wave which propagates within or uh, into. Uh, the fireball, uh, and therefore you get a, a, a correlation between the remnant of the fireball and the emitted hadron, just as for Hawking radiation of a black hole. And in the end, you have only hadrons which are entangled, just as in the other case, you have only photons being entangled. Hmm? Okay. Um, and the problem, and so this year actually will continue, and then this finally will advance. I mean, typically it's described as instantaneous, or let's say on short time scale, the rest also turns to hadrons. The fascinating point is that all these things which were emitted early on, or which are emitted here at once, in the end are all observed with the same temperature, Tc, as we saw in this plot I already showed. OK. And uh, OK, I don't have time to go into that. So then you have two sources of hadrons. One is from this final hadronization. The other one is from the surface radiation. And the, uh, the question is, how can you describe the second one? And our hope is that one can describe that with uh, um, the Hawking page phase transition taking place, which is normally a first order phase transition, but then this is finite volume. We have only limited time, so we hope that one can explain that this is softened to just a crossover. And then you are left with all kinds of highly entangled uh, hadrons, which, according to Sask and Maldacena, one could think of as having all kinds of switches. However, the Correlation between any two of these is very small. That is what is called monogamy of entanglement, namely that when you have a complete entangled uh, uh, state, then the entanglement between any two of them uh, goes like one over the number of these. Okay, and uh, uh, okay, and then. If it is true that here really this gets smooth out, such that this transition, rather than being a sharp phase transition, becomes a soft crossover, then this situation and that situation should not really differ markedly 
on this boundary theory. And that means that probably one should be able to also describe uh, the final result with a model using uh, space transition. Okay, now that was all very fast, and I have no possibility for the last uh, point I wanted to make. Uh, now, uh, all that is highly speculative. We are really on the search for something new we could still do, and it might all be nonsense. So the first question is whether this makes any sense or whether it's possible to describe this ADS here, it's called boundary conformal field theory when you have several uh, topologically uh, not connected objects on the boundary, whether this makes any sense to try to describe hydrogenization with that. Um, then the question is whether really this Hawking page transition becomes softened to a crossover or not. There exist actually toy models for ancient Rosen. Uh, pitch formation, like, uh, for example, you have a black hole, you create many more uh, daughter black holes, and all of them get entangled. But all of that is only done in one plus one dimensional quantum field theory, and it's not clear whether this really carries over to QCD. Uh, okay, and then there are many more. The question whether one can really calculate then the, the form of these ancient Rosen pitches, which are very schematic in this Maldacena Saskin paper and so on. So let me come to the conclusion. Uh, so all these questions, ETH, monogamy, entanglement, decoherence, and so on, thermalization, these are topics of really universal interest. Yeah? ETH is a concept which came from uh, condensed metaphysics. You know? Monogamy comes from information theory, uh, and it's extremely, uh, I mean, all, uh, for example, decoherence is, is technically important because you look at decoherence of a quantum computer. So these are really topics of universal interest. Now, a heavy ion uh, collision system is a perfect system to study that because you have to come as close as possible to the ideal situation of an isolated quantum system. And uh, two heavy ions colliding in the ultra vacuum of the LHC and uh, fragments of this being detected only when one of the hadrons hits a detector much, much, much later. That is really the perfect case of an isolated system and you have petabyte of data. Um, okay, uh, now if you really want to describe this uh, entanglement, a quantum field theoretical description is completely out of the question, it's far too complicated. So you can only hope to describe this time after the, uh, blank time, uh, the page time if there is a valid holographic dual, yeah, also for this part, which you can then hope to be simple enough that at least you can understand qualitative properties. Mm -hmm. And then I just try to toss around some highly speculative ideas to make this perhaps a bit more concrete. Yeah, and uh, we have lots of uh, questions and it would be great if anybody who has a good idea could send me emails. And thanks a lot. Thank you, Andreas. So, any questions? Um, I have a question, which is more about how how the quark gluon plasma sheds protons. Uh, it sheds them from the surface, right? Yeah. At least that's that's the plan. Is there a temperature? Yeah, in the beginning phase. I mean, that is exactly. I mean, this here is by people who do these simulations all their life. Yeah, in the beginning. You have a fireball, yeah. It has always a surface, and yes. from the surface you can always hadronize. Yeah. So, but, so but this is that is, is that most of the hadronization or no? That's uh, like uh, we tried to make an estimate. Uh, it turned out fifty percent, but probably could be ten percent. It could be thirty percent, something like that. Yeah. Okay. But uh, this year is like a certain fraction, yeah, and this year is a larger fraction. 
So it kind of happens all at once that the last part. No, no, it cannot happen all at once. No, I mean, so the, it does the, not last happen. Part, the, it, the second part is assumed to happen at once, at least often, or at least the hydrodynamics is not sensitive to what exactly you assume. But the emission from the surface starts from the beginning. No, no sure. Uh, what I'm asking is, is at the, the end, if, if it kind of bubbles and, and, and fractionates into small bubbles that kind of pop quickly or whether, right? Yeah, that doesn't seem to be the case. A fireball yeah. stays intact as a fireball. It cools, yeah. It emits from the surface, it cools. But then at some point, it's hydrodynamically no longer stable. Yeah, so you, you can no longer solve the hydro equations and then you match it to a hadron gas or hadron resonance gas. Okay. Well, I'm still confused about that, but uh, I'll uh, send you an email. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, anyone else? I think everybody wants coffee. So let's thank the speaker. Okay. Again.